every second week I was getting scanned. They said I wouldn't carry her full term. She probably passed away soon after birth. It was draining, not knowing if she was going to live, she was going to die. The family were not expecting a lot. Another opinion saying no point in doing any major surgery here. Does there someone actually going to believe in her and give her what she deserves? When she was so sick and so low, when she get better then, it's like she was never down, she bounces back. Megan has always been very determined to recover after each procedure. It's less than a year since we first met Megan and her parents. We were unsure as to whether she would even survive infancy. This has gone beyond a short-term survival. She's a miracle, without a doubt she's a miracle. Just, it was draining, not knowing what was coming up, not knowing what, what she was going to be like, not knowing if she was going to live, she was going to die. That was the worst part of the not knowing. Someone said, look, this is going to happen now, this is going to happen. That's, that's not the way things go. You just had to, you had to deal with it. They done the scan and um, the nurse outside just said, the baby's head is measuring big for dates and nothing to worry about, just come back in two weeks time and we'll do a more, um, more detailed scan. So the doctor was there and the doctor, after about 45 minutes of scanning, the doctor said, look, the baby have a very large cleft and the brain is not forming as it should. The br there's very little brain tissue in the brain and um, there's fluid where it shouldn't be and it's just it's a lot of bad news anyway, and I said. In late 2009, medical teams expressed concern in relation to the health of Janice's unborn baby. The diagnosis looked grim for her development and survival. We, every second week, we were, I was getting scanned and it was not getting any, the brain wasn't growing at all a lot. They said I probably wouldn't, I wouldn't carry her full term and um, she probably passed away soon after birth. Mentally, I suppose, you kind of had your bad days, good days. Some days I was down and probably couldn't get out of bed some days. Sophie was three at the time, so we had to think about Sophie too and just focus on her the best we could. We explained that the baby was going to have a cleft and we showed her pictures from the internet of kids with clefts and stuff. Thank God for Sophie, she's the one that kept myself and Dave going uh, all through the months. What are you giving him? What we put out for him? She was due in March 2010, but in February, um, the 11th of February, I was brought in for a C-section, not knowing what was going to happen and just very anxious, very nervous, frightened, everything, and every emotion. There wasn't a sound, not, not a sound in the room, but the doctors were after asking us before, and look, do you, do you want to see her straight away? But over the cleft, they were telling me that the cleft was so severe, I said, look, Beforehand I was saying, no, look, let David go over, take a picture and then show me. But um, the minute she came out, then I was like, bring her over, bring her over. So she was beautiful, you know, she was gorgeous. But she was very, very weak. And um, she was baptised straight away then. But as soon as she got baptised, she was, she was an hour old when she got baptised. And it just went from that hour, she was getting stronger and stronger. So she was left with us for a while in her arms. But when she, saw, she showed signs that she was getting hungry, she said, look, take her to the Neo and warm her up, put her into the incubator and see how she goes. And we'll give her, we'll feed her a bottle or, well, we didn't think she could feed a bottle then. But they, um, fed her through the tube. So you should be just feeling a bit of resistance under her chin and she's trying to push your finger away and you're just resisting that. So perfect. Mm. Mm. She done? Mm. She done? Good. Oh, oh hey. hey. Oh. 
I don't know, I think anyone in, in those shoes would just carry on as normal. That's what we had to do, even when we took her home now. Um, we just treated her like we treated Sophie. There was no bubble wrap or anything. It was just said, look, she's here now. We, we, you know, we carry on as best as we can with her and keep things normal. Christmas morning. I know. Merry Christmas. Oh, I'm lucky. What game? Oh, yeah. Well, one that we that uh, mummy and daddy got under the tree. Dave's looking at you. <laughs> Returning home after her birth, each day was a welcome surprise for Megan's family. When she was so sick and so low. When she get better then, it's like she was never down. She bounces back and you know, she's full of life then again. And it, she, was, she was like, oh my God, like how, how low, like how sick she gets and the way she, she recovers so fast then. In a minute. And I never gave up and I said, no, she, she is going to pull through, she will. With continued uncertainty surrounding her health and only a few weeks old, the family received more news. For the first time, there were glimpses of light in their daughter's future. The first time we went up to Temple Street Children's Hospital, when we met um, uh, Dr. Michael Early, he sat down with us and he just observed Megan. He just looked at her in her buggy and what was written on paper about Megan and what he's seen with Megan was like two different, two different things. My dad was there. David was there and I was like, oh, I can't believe this, like, there's, there's someone actually going to help her and believe in her and, you know, and just give her what she deserves in life, you know, and that was start with then. But, um, no, it was, when that changed, then it was like a total change over and brilliant. Later, Megan and family were back at Temple Street to meet various members of the multidisciplinary team investigating the next steps in Megan's journey. The family, when, when we saw them first, the family definitely were not expecting a lot. They were expecting another opinion saying that there really is no point in doing any major surgery here. She was communicating in her own way and she actually had quite a lively little personality of her own. Certainly I could see that this is not a child that is so compromised that they're not reacting with what's around them. Since her birth, Megan has undergone a number of surgeries. Following shunts which were inserted to drain fluid from around her brain, plastic surgeon consultant Michael Early guided Megan through two major operations to repair her clefts. The first thing that was done once she was born was after she had the shunts put in and her head stopped expanding, well then she was beginning to show signs of improvement. So when I saw her, she was at a stage of having had the advantage of a little bit of growth and the effect of the shunts which had helped greatly. Mm. And he made noise. <laughs> we began looking very carefully at the features of what was wrong with her. And essentially, she appeared to have very definite facial clefting and a craniofacial deformity known as hypertelorism, with her eyes being too far apart. Megan at that stage was quite strange looking, quite frightening looking to people who would not know anything about what a facial cleft looked like. Her whole mid face was wide open, her nose looked in the wrong place, her head was larger than normal. She looked very strange indeed. If she's moving or playing, would she kind of stop, if somebody called her name, would she stop yeah. and turn? Brilliant. Megan's progression has been dramatic and a new journey was about to begin as the team investigate the possibility of one of the most invasive surgeries on Megan to date. After the lip repair and 
the facial cleft repair and the palate repair, all done in the first two operations. The next plan is to protect her eyes primarily and to improve the appearance of her cranium, just the upper skull shape and around the eyes. The critical thing about this is to stop the eyes drying out, to stop the cornea becoming dry and scarred and eventually maybe even cause blindness. Megan's cranial region was now an important concern, continually impacting on her daily life and development. Every aspect of Megan's care is being looked after. There's, there's nothing that um, is not being checked out and it's brilliant that everything is happening up here. Like she will be sedated now tomorrow and, and she will be sleepy and even the, the thoughts that I don't know tomorrow is kind of, kind of scary enough. Um, but I, I know that when she comes, like, it's more information for the doctors and they'll know more and it will help with the operations that are, that are ahead. So it's a good, I'm positive enough about it. Like I, I, I'm not kind of dwelling too much on what's going to happen tomorrow. Just the fact that it has, needs to be done and, and it helps Megan in every way. And she don't care what's going on. The way we look at things in life, you know, she, she's, she changed all her lives really for the better. When we see her, like, struggle, she had to struggle. But when you see how good she is, then she said, you know, she make us feel that we can wake up and do things every day and not to dwell too much on, on the hard times, you know, because she pulls through. So we, we, she leads us, you know, she leads us through it. Yes. Because you're beautiful. You are. She's a beautiful girl. After every surge, you know, when we see her, we'd say, oh, do you know what now? She'll have to be true enough. But then you see how she gets then. We say, we'll get ready for the next step then, you know. She's, she bounces back. She's fabulous. It is thinking about it now. It is hard. But um, every day she's just happy to be here and we're happy that she's here with us. Yeah. She's the best girl. Where's your piggy wiggies? Where's your piggy wiggies? The initial months of Megan's life were filled with a number of surgical procedures and hospital visits. The, the first closure of the lip was a major procedure because it isn't enough just to close the lip defect alone. We had to close the full cleft right up to the eyes as well. The second operation that Megan had was the cleft palate repair and we managed to do that about between three and four months after the first major surgery. And that surprised me that she was so well able for it. At each procedure, you're changing the anatomy that Megan has grown used to. She has to relearn her new anatomy after each procedure. And that's uh, really one of the problems that she would face. Her parents then have to face the change in Megan's appearance. The next big problem was her overall appearance and very strange head shape and the fact that her eyes were almost permanently held open in a very wide staring way and that had to be addressed. Attending the hospital for further scans helped the team monitor Megan's progress after previous surgeries and let them know if they could proceed further with an as yet uncertain third operation within the coming weeks. There was a surgery in March, another one in June, and so this one I will be quite soon, I'd say. It's just when they, all the doctors get together and see what's happening, get a plan together. I might think you just put a hand there. Yeah. 
But we'll see how we get on anyway, okay? So in that once and then I'm welcome back. I don't think about it too much. I don't think sit down and think about oh what's going to happen. It's just the thing that every we get on with things and I kind of, the last minute I get things organised to come up here, just make sure she has days out with her sister because obviously we're, we're, we have to leave first, she's five, and she has to stay down below in Cork. Hey, Gary, you were so good. You were super. We have to get you some stickers, won't we? Oh, my. Oh, my. You got some right now. Oh, there we go. All no. done. Megan's case continues to be of a particularly complex nature, and her vision was now part of a number of important concerns. Consultants Dylan Murray, John Caird and Michael Early took a cross-disciplinary approach in planning the next steps of Megan's hospital treatment. Megan has had her 3D CT scan today, and what I would like to know is how we can improve the shape around the frontoorbital region here. First of all, from the neurosurgical point of view, she has shunt, as we were mm. looking at, around at the back. Mm. And uh, from a craniofacial point of view, she needs remodeling of the area around the front of orbits. Mm. The next plan would be to do this, what would be called a major craniofacial procedure. Difficult thing for the parents to face, because they have seen Megan go through two major surgeries already and seen her run into airway difficulties after the second one and here they are being faced with a further major procedure. The position of the forehead is somewhat protruded so we need to advance that area yeah. right forward. Because the forehead bone and the way in which the muscles of the eye are attached to that bone and the inside of the orbital cavity, which is the socket of the eye, she's not able to close her eyes fully. And this, of course, can cause problems with uh, scarring of the cornea, which is the outer layer of the eye, and ultimately that has the potential to cause blindness. In essence, my involvement here is in relation to the shape of her, her skull and the condition which she has, known as craniosynostosis, we, we would have undertaken 3D CT scans and MRIs to try and uh, help us to plan, in the first instance to plan the surgery, but also to alert us to any other issues that may uh, impact on how we do the surgery. Uh, Megan's case is quite unique, given the very significant issues that she has. Yeah, but I think all the other sutures, I mean, even just the squamotemporal suture there, the, the lambdoids, they're all open. One of the concerning issues in relation to having a diagnosis of craniosynostosis is that the skull doesn't grow at a normal rate, and as a result, the, the brain doesn't have the room to grow. And that can cause raised intracranial pressure, which is something that can affect the development of the brain and you'd be taking bone graft from the back and bringing it around as required? Yep. Okay. When you're dealing with somebody as complex as Megan, you've got to start with the most critical things and then you start with the airway and making sure that she's able to breathe. Vision is incredibly important, obviously, and you've got to make sure that she doesn't develop any, any scarring of the cornea. And then things like feeding and her intellectual function. So these, all these issues take precedence over any cosmetic issues that might be involved. Although, you know, given the nature of the surgery that we do, this is something that we obviously take into account when we're, when we're planning surgery. Yeah. Hello, Janice. Good afternoon to you. Hi, Anne. How, How are you? What it is going to involve is an incision across the top of the head, exposure of the skull bones and the orbital areas from above, and then to take out all of that tissue, the bones, and rearrange them and put them back in again in the right way. She really couldn't be in a better condition for this now. Brilliant. So I personally would like to get as much done while she's young okay. as okay. possible. She will no doubt need many operations in the long-term future, but certainly to get this last big op done should be great, mm -hmm. because uh, that means she'll have had the lip done, the palate done, and then the forehead remodeled. So it'll be, uh, you know, a lot better that way. Sooner rather than later. Mm. So we would probably happy out that everything is done, and we know the next step and sooner rather than later, so very happy. Brilliant news, brilliant news. Right. The ball is rolling again for the next one.
Nervous I book tomorrow, very nervous. Scared for her, but she's grand, she doesn't know what's ahead of her. So she's been very sick, she was after catching the measles, she had um, throat infections, air infections, you name it now, she's actually picking it up. She's back to herself now again, she's very well, getting ready for tomorrow. Came on us too fast altogether, too fast. She's in good health anyway, so she's ready for it and hopefully everything goes to plan. more of a, a fright to us now than, than herself. She don't know what's ahead of her. It's like she knows the place. She, she's looking all around her and say, I, I know this place. I'm back again. Are you back again? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Didn't sleep last night. It was like she knew what was going on. She was whinging and crying and looking for her bottles during the night, but she never does. I was tossing and turning all night and up and down and just my mind was my mind was my own, really thinking about what, she, what's going, what she's going to go through. It's just the worry when, when you're handing her over there now and walking up the door and that's, that's going to be the hardest part. Megan Mahoney, yeah. hospital number 484209, date of birth the 11th. Say goodbye to herself now and try not to think about what's happening to her. Just think about later on, seeing her later. Say goodbye. Say goodbye. Go kisses. Go kisses. Bye, Daddy. Didn't sleep so much, on and off. It was a long night, a long night. It's good now that we're going in early and getting, you know, getting, getting a good, an early start. Yeah. Oh, is she tired? Just, just say goodbye to herself now and. Try not to think about what's happening to her. It's going to be a long day. The most important thing that's happened since we last saw Megan all together was the fact that she's grown. Uh, she's got bigger, she's stronger, and uh, the object of this operation is to protect her eyes and move forward the supraorbital area, protecting the eyes in a better way and gives a more normal shape to the forehead. Throughout the day what we'll be doing is we'll be first of all exposing the bones and then mobilizing the bones. That will be the craniofacial surgeon, Mr. Murray, with the neurosurgeon. The three of us will all discuss about modeling the frontal orbital ridge into the shape we want it to be. Risks of craniofacial surgery are anything ranging from minor to 
very severe. When a surgeon says very severe, it means usually there is a very, very small chance of mortality. It is an advanced form of operation, so there is there's quite a lot at risk. You do try to stay outside the coverings of the brain, which means that the meninges are kept intact and therefore the brain is safe. She's through all the major stuff once we get this done. There's a concern here that her brain won't develop properly if we don't uh, allow that skull to expand fully. The plan today is to advance the forehead forward by essentially taking it off, reshaping it into what would be considered a normal form where we can release the fusion of the skull to allow the brain to expand fully. This is something that is part of her ongoing treatment. She will uh, need many, many operations and has had already uh, quite a few which you've seen. She'll need more operations and this is just part of a process to try and, and maximize her potential for the future. This type of surgery is not something you can do in isolation. This is not something that uh, can be done outside a major setting with a high dependency available, intensive care available. The most important people right now are the anaesthetic team and the nursing team that is with the anaesthetic team. Later on in the morning, the most important team will be the surgical team with the surgical nurses. After that, then, it becomes the recovery nurses and then the high dependency and intensive care unit nurses. So it becomes a very wide team that's looking after her. Yeah, from, from, from the beginning when, when there was no hope there for, for Megan and till now it's just all great that the operations are being done, that, it, that the care is there, you know, and um, of course you can't help but stay positive. It's great for her, like the, the difference between when she was born to ne nearly two years later, the difference in her, she, she's fabulous, you know, fabulous. We were talking to her earlier saying, what's happening now? What are they, what are they at? What stage are they at now? And just thinking what, what's happening to her, you know? and um, just going through the procedure in our heads, thinking the worst, I suppose, all the time. When she was up, asleep and everything, it was hard to watch her go out. But um, Maybe I missed it. She, was, she was grand, she was smiling, you know, looking at the lights and everything, she was great, you know. It was what I was feeling and what David was feeling. But um, I haven't got a nail left now thinking about her. Kept going, trying to keep ourselves occupied, try to eat, cut and eat dragged the days after dragging, absolutely dragged. Control of blood loss is one of the major challenges always in this because it's a prolonged procedure and it's very easy in a child with a long procedure not to realize how much fluid and blood is being lost. That's, that's one challenge. In, in very simple terms, all we're doing is we're taking off the forehead bone and the upper part of the eye sockets. We're shifting them forward and reconstructing the bone in, the, in its new position. And we do this through an incision which goes from ear to ear. Whilst this surgery uh, involves the, the eye sockets and in fact right down almost the floor of the eye sockets and the upper part of the nose, all the scars are kept within the scalp or inside the mouth as far as possible uh, and we didn't have to go through any of the facial scars. It's important not to create any further scarring if you can, not just because of the cosmetic issues that this would entail but also because with all scarring comes restricted growth particularly at, at a young age. The next stage then would be to essentially plan the bone cuts that you do so that you can take off the bone in a manner in which will allow you to put it back together again in as uh, normal a position as possible. 
After a number of, of drawings, Mr. Curd would then take off the bone, initially using some small holes to access into the cavity itself so that he can protect the dura, which is the lining of the, the brain. Yeah, can I just, just have it in a strip maybe at length? The neurosurgical role in, in craniofacial surgery is essentially to, to try and remove the, the skull bones without injuring the underlying structures. Try to get the, the skull bones off the lining of the brain without tearing the structures underneath. Once the skull bones are then taken off, essentially I put them on a separate table next to the operating table and I work on them and, and start to, to put them into a normal position. These bones are then replaced into their, their new position using plates and screws that are dissolvable. Uh, and we use a significant number of these and it's a little bit like a scaffold, a jigsaw that we put back together again in its new position. Following this, it's a matter of, of closing the incision, making sure that we have a drain in, on the inside so that any excess blood that develops will, will be drained out, uh, and that reduces the chances of a hematoma or infection. Since this surgery is, is very invasive, if you consider what we're doing, we're, we're peeling back the layers of the, of the scalp and then taking off the bone, we're reshaping it and putting it back on. But actually, from a physical point of view, it is not that terribly invasive. It's not a procedure that appears to be very painful post-op, and we know this because the children do recover very quickly. Within four or five days, they're actually gone home. It does even amaze me how resilient some of these children are and how quickly they recover and heal from, from what is, is uh, perceived as a very invasive procedure. I've just finished doing the final bits and pieces and sewing up the skin and she looks good, looks, looks very good. The actual procedure we ended up doing, uh, we ended up doing by and large what we intended to do in the first place. As the operation proceeded, we discovered that there was quite a lot of oozing from the bone, so that limited doing an even larger procedure. She may or may not need something else done to the back of the skull at some stage, but that will be purely cosmetic. And uh, I suspect that what we've done today should be enough from this point of view. It's a subtle change in one way, and yet it's a very obvious change in another way. She will look quite different to the way she looked when she presented first. Uh, there's no doubt about that just begin to get swollen at this stage and by tomorrow she will be very very swollen so don't worry about that. Looking at her now on table while she still has her endotracheal tube in it's difficult to really give a proper comment on how she looks but it looks an awful lot better. Everything went well now thank God. She has to wait another way now before we can, before we can see her. Yeah everything is done and dusted. We keep her sitting up at this point in time because she'll be a bit swollen after the operation. We don't want her eyes to, to get any worse than that. So hopefully after this operation she'll be able to close them a little bit better and protect herself. She's well. She's well. She's had her tube taken out. She's quiet. I don't think she's too uncomfortable. She's capable of, of moving around the place. One of the extraordinary things about Megan, and it really was apparent at that first consultation, was her personality. And a personality that showed she was interested, she was very much alive, she was watching everything going on around her. And that sort of personality, that gives her strength as well. And Megan has always been very determined herself to recover after each procedure. 
probably a recovery for a, another hour or two, I think, until, until she wakes up herself. Yeah. And then up to dental oh, care. Yeah. Must be drained. Correct. I'd say the father's going to be very different to what he was saying. Can't wait to see her now. Megan has always been there herself. She is fantastic from the point of view of bouncing back after each procedure and saying, OK, now we move forward. In the future, Megan is going to need that aspect of looking forward because uh, uh, she, she does face a lot of further procedures. Now, None of them are going to be as major as the procedures as the ones she's had done so far, we hope. But she's still going to need a lot of intervention. I thought um, when, when we seen her last March for her operation, that, that would be the worst. But um, I think I got, um, when I seen her, I was a bit shocked and a bit upset in the ICU when I seen her after surgery. Then at the back of your mind, then it's far the best. Like it's it, she's going to be good afterwards. It's definitely far the best, and we made the right decision, hundred percent. A short time after surgery, Megan was back to meet with Mr. Early. Her forehead structure was reshaped significantly and the primary goal of protecting her eyes achieved. In order to get at the bones of the face, forehead and skull, you have to make a very large incision. And the incision basically goes from ear to ear. It's made a zigzag so that when the hair grows back, the hair doesn't grow with a parting through it. The hair will cross over in zigs and zags, and the scar will be exceedingly well disguised once she grows a bit of hair again. How are you? How's Megan? She's doing very good, very yeah. well. Amazing. Yeah. Hiya. Immediately after the surgery, she, she would have looked relatively close to the way she looks now. But over the 24 hours after the surgery, any child who's had a craniofacial procedure gets very, very swollen. They get a lot of facial and orbital edema. So she went through a couple of days of being hardly able to open her eyes, very swollen face. Now that's all settled down. That's fantastic. Ten weeks after surgery, the bones will have healed. It will all be pretty solid. If she fell on the ground, she'd be the same as any other child. Uh, it's not going to compromise the repair, and her eyes are very well protected. Hey, Liz. Some happy handies. <laughs> it's constantly a journey, and we're going through it, and we get over one hurdle, and then it's time, as today, now we're going to see what's next down the lane for her. The important thing now at this stage is that her eyes are really well protected mm. and uh, the gunge that you used to see in the eyes, that stopped I presume, yeah. you know, that when she wakes up in the morning her eyes look clear. Do. Yeah, that's great. The next stage for Megan is communication and building up communication. We would call her back for a communication session. You met Tanya yeah. earlier this year? <laughs> Megan, Megan is now nearly two years old. Uh, 
and uh, at that stage you'd expect a fair bit of language to have developed. One of the problems about any child that needs major surgery is that each surgical episode and each hospitalization tends to set them back quite a bit. We are now going to have to look at that from the point of view of language learning skills, language development and speech and language monitoring throughout. So probably right now the most important thing for Megan is the whole communication skills aspect of her growth. For the moment I think we will leave her strictly alone. Let her get over all of this. This was very major surgery. Um, let her, let her just recover from that properly. Let her scalp settle down. And uh, at some stage during the year, I'm not sure when, we'll, we'll see how she is. Mm -hmm. At some stage, we'll do something with the notching of the upper eyelids. It's very hard to believe that it's only a year. In fact, it's less than a year since we first met Megan and her parents. She has gone from a child that looked very unusual. We were unsure as to what she would develop like. We were unsure as to whether she would even survive infancy. She's now at a stage where she's beginning to be comparable to other toddlers. You're beginning to actually say, well, now the next milestone she should be reaching is X. So we're talking in a very positive way about long-term future development. This has gone beyond a short-term survival. See you again. All right. Bye bye, Megan. Bye. <laughs>
piggy wiggies mm. and hopefully she'll walk down the aisle. Well, if she don't, we'll get her. Her she bike, there, she'll have a bike. Seven, we put her on the bike with the flowers and up she goes. One of the bridesmaids will push her. Oh, I want this. Uh, huh? The oh. king, you can Just tried to make the best of it. And mm. I mean, it must have to happen now, it's unbelievable. She's American, without a doubt, she's American.